Okay, so a very warm welcome to everybody. Oh, sorry. This morning, um, I have a great privilege in uh, welcoming Professor Peter Guzuasis. Para. <laughs> from the University of British Columbia. Pronounced correctly. Who um, <laughs> I've had the pleasure to meet over this last year and been very inspired by his work in arts based education research. And uh, Peter's been a real pioneer working in this field for 15 years or more with colleagues over at UBC. Um, he has written many papers. Um, we've got links to these works. Um, some have been circulated prior to these sessions. We've got an hour this morning, Peter, to share um, his work around poetic inquiry, but we have another session tomorrow in the morning. If you would like to come along again, uh, please come and come join us. Uh, but I'm very excited to see what's going to happen. Who knows? Good question. Uh, right. Um, but over to you, Peter, and you're very welcome. Actually, oh, good, great. And uh, so if everyone can, can get a tongue depressor. Uh, <laughs> so I was going to start by playing today, but uh, perhaps I'll, s I'll end with playing instead, uh, because I'd like to get on with this and make sure that we have enough time to cover everything. So yesterday we talked about autoethnography. And for me, I define autoethnography in a new, more expanded word, because as someone like Kula knows, the word auto, or the prefix auto, pronounced afto in Greek, has multiple meanings. It's not, not only the self, but if I point to an object and I say afta, that means that, right? Or if I make it plural and I say afta, that means those. Or if I say afton, that means him. Or afti means her. So the word auto is much bigger than merely self. Also, the word Ethno, or the, the part of the word autoethnography, ethno, comes from the root of the, the Greek word ethos, which has to do with culture or place. For many years, because ancient Greek was initially translated from the ancient Greek to English via German, believe it or not. So the first lexicon of ancient Greek was written in German, published in 1830-something, and um, so for many years all the translations that were done in English were done from a German lexicon. Oh my God. So lost in translation is uh, an understatement. There are two words uh, that Aristotle used. One was ethos, and one was ethos, and ethos had to do with the character of one's being, the character of being. So now we have this ethno having multiple meanings as well, and then graphi in Greek also has different applications. So, you know, kula, what would you say? Like if I said, you know, the word graphi, graphi certainly can be used for writing, but if you say zografo, doesn't that mean drawing? Yeah, zografizo, okay? So that graphi in there, if I apply it so I'm talking about music, I'm writing music. So this word has a lot of multiple meanings to unpack. Now, within this context of autobiographical research and autoethnographic research, poetry has snuck in. Of course, poetry is very personal and very descriptive of ideas that, um, of the self. Now, there are a, whole, a lot of layers to this, so let me just get right back into it. Studies on student attitudes toward music education experiences and toward music in general range in scale from hundreds of students surveyed, and there are a number of studies uh, that were done in the mid-2000s, down to just one student, and that was done in 2006 by Scheib. Perspectives taken on understanding student attitudes in music education have included gender issues, pedagogical strategies, community school partnerships, and extracurricular experiences. Studies interested more deep in more deeply understanding the relationship between young people and music include the work of Ed Asmus, Bowles, Button, Hoffman, and Meisner, and this work goes back to 1993. The methods, the research methods used across the literature vary, often according to the scale of the study, however, most often employ questionnaires and surveys, and sometimes combined with interviews or focus groups. The results are often filtered through tables and charts, 
indicating the frequency, the type or number of responses gathered. They're coded and presented according to the most standard descriptive research and case study practices. Only one paper that was found in the literature review uh, a was a professional paper, actually, not a research paper, that presented data in a form that honors the original speech acts of the student participants. It encapsulates a series of verbatim statements made by young musicians about the joy music has brought to their lives. So when I talk about verbatim statements, essentially what we were speaking about yesterday, text boxes. Here's an interview statement, and so um, Hoffman would make a comment and say, for example, one student believed, and then here's a text bo box with the exact verbatim statement of what the student said. In the present study, I employed an arts-based approach that offers a complementary perspective to the central findings of the earlier studies, that music plays a key role in students' lives, and that music is generally received and perceived to be fun, engaging, and rewarding, as well as demanding and very disciplined. So the present paper aligns itself with a form of arts-based educational research called poetic inquiry, which Andrew Sparks, who we read quite a bit about yesterday, refers to as poetic representation. Poetic inquiry falls under three main categories, autobiographical or autoethnographical studies, poetic transcription and representation of participant interviews or other data, and theoretical poetry that addresses various scholarly issues. I'll share a piece of a theoretical poetry with you later on because I do some of that work as, all, as well, and I just attended the sixth International Poetic Inquiry Conference that, of all things, happened to be held at UBC this year. And uh, it attracted over 200 participants from all over the world. And I can say that 95% of what was presented at that conference was of the theoretical nature, uh, theoretical uh, approach taken. So this study, however, falls under the second category, that of poetic transcription and representation. And there are a number of studies that use this approach. In a fairly recent meta-analytical -ana and cross-disciplinary study of poetic inquiry in the social sciences, fully one-third of over 300 peer-reviewed studies employing poetry in the fields of education, anthropology, sociology, psychology, social work, and other fields made use of these methods. Um, this may seem surprising to you that there are that many people writing poetry and getting it published in refereed journals as research. Quite impressive. But we've come a long way. So researchers make use of poetic transcription and representation for a number of reasons. As Laurel Richardson offers, by settling words together into new configurations, the relations created through echo repetition, rhythm, and rhyme let us see and hear the world in a new dimension. Poetry is thus, thus a practical and powerful means for reconstitution of worlds. It suggests a way out of the numbing and deadening, disaffective, disembodied, schizoid sensibilities characteristic of phallocentristic social science. Phallocentristic. Interesting. Corinne Glesny adds, I found myself through poetic transcription searching for the essence conveyed, the hues, the textures, and then drawing from all portions of the interviews to juxtapose details into a somewhat abstract representation. Somewhat like a photographer who lets us know a person in a different way, I wanted the reader to come to know my subject through very few words. Laurie Nielsen, another Canadian from the east coast of Canada, offers data poems are not just transcriptions or intervi of interviews or observations with random line breaks. They must be spare, economical, rich, and resonant, an elixir, potent. An effective data poem is no different from an effective poem. Each word, right down to the, or, and, matters. Each line break matters. Each space matters. Finally, Janine Carr offers the notion that the main goal of the experimental text is to evoke the reader's emotional response and produce a shared experience. Poetry as an experimental text form 
can be a very effective way to reconstruct and confirm the lived experience of others while challenging researchers to learn about their abilities to communicate qualitative inquiry in a different way. Now, as is evident through a broad and richer array of the literature review and, and the, the handful of quotes that I've shared with you today, poetic transcription and representation has become an accepted and potent method for presenting participant data in artistic ways. The present study makes the use of Japanese haiku. This form, rather than a more common approach of free verse seen in most of the literature. Why haiku, with its mandate to capture immediate experience and its rigid structure of three lines consisting of five, seven, five syllables per line? Other researchers have employed Japanese poetic forms such as the slightly longer tanka, which is five, seven, five, seven, seven in their transcription process. And if you've noticed, as I was reading the quotes to you, I used haiku to take the essence of the quotes and represent that for you. So I could read these over again, but you can do it yourselves. I'll provide you with the script. You'll have this. You can look at this. And start thinking now in terms of how the haiku actually takes the essence of what it is the speaker is attempting to elaborate. As also with yesterday, I do a lot of things playing around with uh, photographs. So in a sense, for me, you note that this is a reflection and that these reflections are a reflection of the fuller quote. So um, let's go to, yes, let's go to here. So. For example, social work scholar Richard Furman, who's a very dear friend of mine, wonderful colleague, and his co-investigators provide a collaborative model of poetic inquiry where poetry is used as data as a means of data representation and as a process of inquiry in order to explore the nature of poetry as a tool of qualitative research for investigating human phenomena. Haiku were also used in Prendergast's attempt to crystallize her dissertation topic. Blasco and Mercy in, in 1998 consider the use of haiku in interdisciplinary studies on creativity and suggest the writing and reading of haiku involve imagination, insight, and the juxtaposition of concepts leading to novel ideas. Russell sees the value of haiku in curriculum and pedagogy and concludes that the haiku moment can be appreciated for what it represents rather than as a comparison with other experiences. He continues, haiku position our thoughts to consider the importance of the moment in our lives and to provide a space of reflection for us to consider that what we do not access our most memorable experiences in a linear way, but play them out through our continuing emotions and thoughts. So interestingly, haiku have been used as a methodology in a series of studies in the health sciences as a way to allow for reflection on issues such as aging, death, and clinical practices, and teaching and learning experiences in nursing. For example, Sabashinsky invites nursing students to reflect on aging issues in light of their reading of May Sarton's novel, As We Are Now, through, through haiku. She notes that students use the concise framework of haiku to explore their own insight, emotions, and ethical values about aging, power, and institutionalization. So inspired by the use of haiku in a variety of educational studies and beyond, I'm going to present a portion of the haiku suite that follows. In the haiku suite, all the words were distilled from interview transcripts from a total of 14 interview subjects, six girls, eight boys, all of whom were interviewed in the cafeteria of their secondary school during their participation in a rhythm and blues band class in West Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. All the boys and two of the girls were instrumentalists in the band. The remainder of the girls were vocalists who took turns as soloists and backup singers. At the beginning of the school year, the teacher, Michael Toth, who's an experienced performer in rock and R&B bands himself, handed out a compact disc of 25 songs for each member to learn on their own, transcribing each vocal and instrumental part by ear. So beginning of the year, you come into my R &B, or Mike's R&B class, and he just gives you the CD and says, okay, take it away. So the kids that are in the R&B class, where do they come from? They come from jazz band, concert band, 
orchestra. He has that part of the program as well. But he doesn't have a choral program, oddly enough. There's only so much time in the day, and he's dedicated a lot of time and effort into the R&B. And he also teaches composition through recording technology. So he's got an incredible um, recording suite. They record all of their rehearsals, so they're able to go back, listen to the rehearsals, <coughs> critique their performances. And over the course of the year, the kids learn 25 new R&B tunes every year. And so by the end of the year, they do performances. Canada Day is July 1st, so the band stays together. They do a great performance on Canada Day. Uh, they go all across the province and play in uh, small music festivals. Um, and, uh, and also they play at local community centers and, and do that kind of thing. So the kids are gigging actively. Okay, let me play, a, give you a little sense of what uh, the R&B sounds like, R&B band. Okay, so that's just a small clip to give you a, a little taste of, of what they sound like. Over the course of three years, I visited the RMB classes at Sentinel Secondary School on nearly a weekly basis. I spent time working with the singers on vocal production, dance steps, and general performance techniques. I also spent time with the guitarists, bass players, and horn players about riffs, feel, and tone, and also the little R&B band things where they're going back and forth with their horns and, and uh, actually performing rather than standing stiffly playing notes. Not concert band, it's R&B band, right? Rather than work as a detached researcher, I placed myself in the middle of the music making process. Oftentimes listening to the group rehearsals while standing and dancing between the horns and the singers. So trying to inspire the singers and rather than saying, I'm a soul man, I think, I'm a soul man, you know, and really trying to get the girls worked up and, and get the, the horn players worked up as well. So in a sense, I was their rah-rah, their coach, trying to coach them through things. Uh, all of my meetings with the students were informal. The students knew me as a guitarist who performed duets with their R&B teacher. Uh, sometimes Mike and I would be uh, uh, playing and recording each other, uh, playing duets before the kids came in, and so they would listen, and then as they were listening to us perform, they would they would do the setup. So they did all the setup of microphones, set up the, the classroom space, and they would also break down everything. So a really organized group of kids. And uh, they also knew that I was a professor in music education at the university who led their teacher through his master's thesis. And Mike did one of the early theses uh, that, um, I, and I have some clips of it, and I, one day I, sh I should at least share them with Catherine, uh, make them available. Um, he did some brilliant work with original compositions uh, that were background to some incredible stories uh, in his interactions, not just with kids in music, but with administration and staff and, and other people uh, in his life. So the words and phrases, uh, oh, I should say that when it came time to organize the interviews, the students were comfortable with referring to me on a first, ba first name basis. The words and phrases are transcribed across interviewees without distinction of individual voices in an attempt to form a collective portrait of student thoughts, attitudes, reflections, and philosophical statements in re response to each question. In this way, then, the haiku become choral soliloquies, where individual voices blend together into choral-like representations. So in a sense, we're taking, in other words, to make it a little bit clearer, across the interviews on each question, we would distill the essence of words that came out of each interview into a haiku and make it a collective haiku to represent what everyone said. Monica wrote one, I wrote one, separately, we came together, we looked at our haiku, and uh, well, let's see what happens, because we're going to do one together. But that's another, so let's wait a moment. The titles for each haiku are intended to comment on the content of each poem in the manner of more traditional qualitative transcript coding. A brief discussion presenting possible interpretations of the suite and its value within music education 
research on this topic will conclude the presentation. So, does anybody know where this comes from, this image? So I grew up in Philadelphia and I love going to the Philadelphia Museum of Art and there um, they proudly own the three musicians, the Picasso three musicians. And so this is a snapshot just of a little portion of the three musicians. And uh, so I'm using that as the backdrop for the haiku. So let's take turns reading the slides. And where did the popsicle sticks go? The collective popsicle sti sticks. Okay. So, Allison, would you like to read this one for me? Uh, sorry, how did you become involved in music? First haiku. Yes. Never sang before, made it, was very happy. I just love to sing. Thank you. Um, Catherine. Really wanted me to get involved. I liked it a lot. Jackie. Before I was born, when I was still in my room, I loved his music. Next question. What's most interesting to you about R&B? Deb. Everything by the oil relationship and through the band as well. Daniel. One thing listening, I mean, I love to jam, but playing is great. Luca. Different people together and stuff like that. What's the most interesting thing about making music? Karen? Uh, let me go to the next one, sorry. Karen? To be lively and to have lots of energy. Play it right if you can, yes. Federica? Learn music, be one, all these minds work together, it's life and energy. Leanne? Is it Leanne? I, I can't see here. Well, I'll skip this one because I can't read it. Nathan. Funk mentality to professional feeling is the most important thing. There we are. Daniel. A lot of passion and you have to be real about the passion. What's the role of music in your life? David? Kate. A ticket to sell garage rock bands with my friends, except for Lisa. Tom. Music flows through you. Let me look at the my life. Helps to compose. Helps to compose me. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now what we're going to do is look at a video clip. This was not a student, this was from a previous year. Um, there's so much data that I've got, <laughs> choking in data, right? Like we all have all this data, what are we going to do with this? I mean, I could go back and, and analyze this in a more traditional manner, I could do all sorts of things, but um, this is a video clip. Um, we, we piloted the questions in both of the prior years. And this is just one individual student. So I'm going to play about 30 or 40 seconds of a clip of this student talking. Um, and I would like you to write a haiku based on what this student is talking about. Okay, so I'll play it a few times. I'll play it a few times. So this is to simulate the process that we went through in terms of watching the interviews, writing haikus, moving from one question to the next, and then coming together and comparing our haikus. So, I'll wait till you're ready. Here we go. Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, press the wrong button, Peter. Come on. Okay, here we go. It's just a way 
through, well, not just my voice or through writing, but it's another outlet for me to express myself. I can use like uh, tools such as my trumpet to get ideas out of my brain, and I can create them, and I have sort of a loose, like, loose template through scales, but I can create things in my brain in patterns, and I can use those patterns and create things, and then they come through my trumpet and out for other people to hear, and then they can evaluate that, and they can get feedback, and that can allow me to tailor things, and it's a whole learning process. When I'm not playing, like, I'm okay, just walking so around. Okay, so stop. So that's the clip. I'll back up again. I'll play it one more time, or two more times. So here we go. So the question was, what is the role of music in your life? That's the header. So here we go. Here's playing number two. It's just a way for me to express myself through, well, not just my voice or through writing, but it's another outlet for me to express myself. I can use like, the tools such as my trumpet to get ideas out of my brain, and I can create them, and I have sort of a loose, like, loose template through scales, but I can create things in my brain in patterns, uh -huh. and I can use those patterns and create things, and then they come through my trumpet and out for other people to hear, and then they can evaluate that, and they can get feedback, and that can allow me to tailor things, and it's a whole learning process. When I'm not around. playing, like I'm just walking around, oh. and I'm thinking about... Okay, let me back it up one more time. I'm doing one also, so just for see what it looks like. So this form of the haiku is five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. Five, seven, five. Here we go, one more time. It's just a way for me to express myself through, well, not just my voice or through writing, but it's another outlet for me to express myself. I can use like a tool such as my trumpet to get ideas out of my brain, and I can create them, and I have sort of a loose, like, loose template through scales, but I can create things in my brain in patterns, uh -huh. and I can use those patterns and create things, and then they come through my trumpet and out for other people to hear, and then they can evaluate that, and they can get feedback, and that can allow me to tailor things, and it's a whole learning process. When I'm not playing... Let's do one more. I'll play it one more time, and then let's share some of our haiku. One more time. This is to refine your haiku. Make sure you've gotten the essence, chosen the words that you feel represent what he's trying to say with regard to this one question. Here we go. One more. Let me back it up. Oh, here we go. It's just a way for me to express myself through, well, not just my voice or through writing, but it's another outlet for me to express myself. I can use like a tool such as my trumpet to get ideas out of my brain, and I can create them, and I have sort of a loose, like, loose template through scales, but I can create things in my brain in patterns, uh -huh. and I can use those patterns and create things, and then they come through my trumpet and out for other people to hear, and then they can evaluate that, and they can get feedback. And that can allow me to tailor things, and it's a whole learning process. When I'm not around. playing, like I'm just walking around, I'm thinking. Okay. So I'll use the popsicle sticks again, so I um, don't point at individuals. Let's see what we get. <laughs> Mix them up a bit. Okay. Sarah, would you like to share your haiku? <laughs> Sorry. Did you get it? Or, or no, we can pass. You have the right to pass. We can pass too. Yes, of course. Sure, certainly. Allison. Conversation. Interesting. Okay. I like that. Um, David. Okay, fine. Pass. Thank you. Nathan. Pardon? Nearly done. Nearly done. Okay, thank you. Deb. Pass. Fine. Jackie. 
recommendation, but trumpet is my tool, expresses ideas, patterns, others hear, give feedback. Uh huh. I'll read mine. To express myself, a loose template, brain, patterns. Trumpet, create things. Tom? Uh, play through my trumpet, create patterns, <coughs> scales, create. Lose myself, express. Uh huh. So, uh, just with the few that we've shared thus far, wh would anyone like to comment on them? What are you thinking about? I can see it relates to what I've put, so similar phrasing. Would you like to share yours too? Um, my voice through my trumpet, creativity, an outlet, patterns, creativity for others to hear. Yeah. So I wouldn't use a positivist term like correlation, <laughs> okay, because we're not measuring these. But it seems that we are leaning toward certain words and that certain words resonate with us as individuals, but not just as individuals, but across the group. It's interesting because people here have actually got forms of words. They're not the words they use, but... And that too, they, they yeah. can... So, yeah. All right, so, and, and listen, I, well, I should say, when, when we're w working with numbers, for example, uh, and we take, uh, if I took, if everyone here, if I asked you to rate what he said and you gave on a one to five scale, right, and then I took a mean and standard deviation of the score, that's not exactly representing what you all said as well. I'm, in a sense, boiling it down too. Yeah. So it is, I mean, you know, the, the thing that I was saying earlier about talking about essences, getting at the essence of what's being expressed. Does anyone want to make another comment? Does anyone want to make a comment with regard, for example, to the haiku that you saw and then how they relate to the haiku that we just wrote with regard to the little interview snippet? Any questions, comments, concerns? Yes. There are some differences. How do you, when you're searching and distilling this information, so to you, how do you choose or decide what becomes that finished? Yeah, so in the, in the negotiation, if there were four of us, on a research team, and, and we're taking our interview interviews and, and breaking them up like this, and then writing haiku or writing tanka or writing free verse, right? Um, then there would be the final step would be the negotiation between the four of us as, as to what we think most powerfully, viscerally represents, and what we want. Again, I mean, this is about how much of the researcher is in the research itself. So what we would, what we think the subjects are saying, or subject is saying, and how we want to amplify that for who's reading it, for the audience. I think, I think I felt yeah. that because I, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to remain faithful to what the student has said, but I guess there's also that desire to want to play with the words a little. Sure. But then it's still very much about a personal perspective. And I'd like to check it out with him. I want to ask him what he thinks of my haiku. Because if he and we did take them back to the students as well. Yes. Uh-huh. 
Right. Drilling down to the essence. Yes. Yes, sir. It's an interesting parallel because it feels like what people were doing, and I felt I was doing to start with, is in the way you kind of compose something that's the essence of what you said. But quite quickly, you get into what I think Catherine's talking about, which mm -hmm. is more analytical. Or it, it feels like a research process. Mm -hmm. First job, gather your data and sort of organize it, and the second point is you do something with it, and it feels like you maybe sort of who we all are. We, we try to get into the do something with it quite quickly, yeah. um, but it's very hard. Mm -hmm. Well, let me offer my interpretations, okay? So all poetry offers the reader an implicit invitation to linger in the language, to take the time to rest at the end of a line or verse, and to reflect on the meanings being made. From this perspective, the impressions made upon the reader of this suite cannot be predict predicted or prescribed. What is possible is to present a range of responses from the authors of the collaborative inquiry that we've written and highlight how poetic renderings are open enough to allow for individual interpretations. As artist researcher teachers, we want to know why and how music matters to adolescents, but researchers frequently represent the ideas of co-collaborators, the students, in ways that neither matters to them nor captures the affective nature of their music making. That's a challenging thought. By using haiku and artistic form, we attempted to evoke some of the experience when experiences when they are thinking about making music. In other words, we intended to amplify the impact of aff affective impressions that these students shared with us. So what was being shared was affective, how we analyzed it was affective as well. In this way, the research in informs the art form as the art form informs the research. And this is a key concept of arts-based educational research. I believe that the haiku captures the depth and intensity of emotions, engagement, and transformative affects that adolescents ex experience through music making. And I'm able to report if you were to read the entire paper, that music matters on profound levels to young people. Our response to the haiku suite is imbued with a critical pedagogy perspective that opens up questions such as, how can we offer an education to young people that gives them the happiness, passion, challenge, and satisfaction described by the participants of the present study? What can we do to allow for positive music-making experiences, such as those described herein, to transfer into education in general? Another study I recently completed that looked at students in, enrolled in guitar classes. And these aren't kids that you know, have been studying guitar for a long time. They're not involved with other aspects of the music program, but they want to do something with music. Everybody loves music, after all. If you look at the Kaiser Foundation study from 2011, we know that adolescents spend over three and a half hours a day listening to music, downloading music, arranging their own folios of music, looking at YouTube, arranging YouTube clips of music. So music is a, an active part of everyone's life, particularly adolescents. But you go into the, I don't know what it's like here in secondary schools, but in North America, typical secondary school, when you go into a music classroom and you look around at who's there and what's being done, we're lucky if between 15 and 20 percent of the school population is participating in music in school. So these guitar classes attract a whole other population of the school. Kids who typically wouldn't go into a music program. And the, the the and incredible things that we're learning from from talking with these kids and from and I do we did do survey with questions and questionnaires so I have nice pie charts and bar graphs um, in the study looking at three secondary schools um, over 200 kids when I posed the loaded question um, music music is the most important class that I take in school 90% of the kids agreed and strongly agreed, right? And these, this is the, the guitar class kids. 
and when, I, when we were looking at the open-ended responses, they were along the lines of, I wouldn't come to school if I didn't have guitar class. When I come to guitar class first thing in the morning, I'm able to hang out with my friends, play music, and that sets the tone and gets me thinking right for the rest of the day. Right? So these, th these are the kind of visceral responses that we're getting from kids. Peter, have you used this sort of approach? Um, has it been used in other subjects? And maybe where students' high teens are, you know, quite, I don't know, um, forceful in, in, in terms of things they're not enjoying. You know, they're learning and... and no, I haven't, but... It, curriculum it would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Is the subject that used in high, uh, at UBC in the higher education across other disciplines? Uh, I'm, I've just written uh, a five question, a, a little five question survey about the, uh, the role of the curriculum courses in the teacher education program and, and the questions are quite loaded and I'm waiting for permission from my department head um, to administer <laughs> the survey through the music curriculum course. Um, because our curriculum course, all of the curriculum courses, math, music, science, phys ed, et cetera, have been cut from 39 hours in a semester for elementary school teachers to 22 hours. It's not enough time to give, even scratch the surface on what's important to do and what's important for children to learn, not just in one grade, but K through seven in those subjects. So we're trying to regain some of the ground that we've lost, and uh, we keep b being shut down as a, fac as a faculty. And so uh, this, is, this is a way that I am going to go in and ask loaded questions. And, uh, and yeah, anyway, so that's a good question. So I'd like to share what Elliot Eisner said back in 2004. What can education learn from the arts about the practice of education? I believe that haiku... Oh, I said this, okay. So we wrote our own haiku response to the impressions of the students. What do we learn here? Music is adrenaline for education. So the haiku crafted from our data offer metonymic understandings as they stand in for unedited speech acts of the student participants. The intention of the haiku suite is to cause emotional reverberation with the individual reader as they engage with these renderings in light of their own interests and experiences. Thus, using the methodological language of poetic representation, we begin to make sense of how to interpret and incorporate these findings into the literature on this and related, related topics in arts learning. From that perspective, I hope to create further openings, new forms of data representation for educational researchers and new lenses through which to view learning and the impact of music engagement in our lives. So rather than undertaking an, an objective empiricism where researchers believe in the antiseptic nature of data, I acknowledge the notion that pure data does not exist. And one can read about this in Stephen Pepper back in 1942 in his, his great book called World Hypotheses, and 20 years later with Thomas Kuhn in The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, both state, bottom line, there is no such thing as pure data because the researcher puts their hands all over it from the get-go. So what are we really doing? Um, all data is impregnated with not only with theory, but with interpretation and lived experiences from one's practice. That quote-unquote data is also influenced by practice was a new idea to research back in 2008 when, when this study was published and I was doing this kind of work. And as reflective, reflexive practitioners, the ways that we understand our professional, in my case, teaching and artistic, musical, and research practice is influenced by presuppositions and predispositions gleaned from a variety of practical, experiential, and theoretical sources. So I admit this. So how we teach, as well as how we interact with our co-participants in the research process, inevitably affect and effect the data. Extending notions suggested by Richard Furman, poetry is more than mere data. Think about it. The poetry isn't just data if we use words that the students used. It's a means of representing the results, as well as the interpretations of the results by the researchers. And in the present study, the interviews may be considered 
the interviews can be considered as the data, the research method, poetic representation as a form of design and analysis, the haiku, a form of po poetic representation, the results were presented as haiku, and the interpre interpretation were the poems that we wrote as well. So the haiku have a multiple function, as well as numerous interpretations that readers may bring to the poetry and topics at hand. So affective empirical research techniques enable us to focus on the intensity of the affective aspects of our experiences. An affective empirical approach enables the researcher to extract, extrapolate, interpolate, and intensify the affective aspect of the data at hand. I worked with the students and designed the questions with the students' experiences in mind. Thus, they became, became co-authors in the creative process of describing their experiences in the R&B band and in how music plays a role, an important role, in their lives. That aspect of the research process and the notion that poetry can be read and reread with a variety of interpretations is what makes these haiku representations of living inquiry rather than inanimate frozen data tables. Haiku are inherently fleeting and impressionistic. So if we look at the range of qualitative research over the last 40 years, the different methods, I would put this kind of work out here. <laughs> on the avant-garde level, right? But that's what the arts are all about. So while we do not wish to dictate what, oh, while we do not wish to dictate how readers may make meaning from the suite, and as artists we recognize the possibility of divergent interpretations to our own, I contend that poetic representation and representation poetic transcription and representation have allowed for a more direct access to student participant voices, free of clutter, numerical obscurity, and academic obfuscation. So what have we learned? Music matters to young people. It matters in profound and existential ways. My hope is that these findings may be used presented as they are in, in an intentionally access accessible art form, may be used to keep the fires of arts education burning in our schools. As, a, as an example of complementary arts-based research, this study confirms earlier findings about student attitudes toward their music education, and more importantly, extends these findings into beginning an articulation of the deeply held affective and philosophical dimensions that music and education can open up in the lives of young people. Finally, I offer a haiku in response to reading the haiku presented in the data analysis. Breathe in, out again. Hear the entire world from here. The heart's soul. Music. Thank you. Should I play you uh, an example of what would be um, the freer right. style kind of poetic inquiry that's going on these days? Um, this was a, a piece that I also talk about quite a bit um, in terms of the metaphor between the music and the poetry. It's a poem called Winter Alphabet. It has 19 short verses. Um, as a guitarist, I like playing in a lot of different tunings, and I play around a lot with open tuning, dad gad, uh, open D, open G. Um, uh, I find it interesting because by playing in a different tuning, and I also read in the and, and write standard notation in these tunings now. It's, it's been a long time that I've been doing it. That by doing this, it puts me in a different headspace, in a different way of analyzing and thinking about music, right? So when I'm doing this with poetry, it just amplifies that. So I have a colleague, Carl Lego, who I believe I quoted here today, but certainly quoted heavily yesterday. And he wrote Winter Alphabet and uh, gave it to me. And 19 verses. So and, and I read it over and over again. And then I also had Carl read it for me. And I recorded what he wrote. And as I listened to it, I thought of this as a motivic theme in variations. So you hear the motive, it's a ground bass. That's what you hear first. And then based on that theme, 
there are variations. So each, vari and now, and I purposely wrote it, composed it, so that it may sound like an open tuning, but it's not. It's actually a standard tuning. It's a real finger twister. So I'll play that for you now. So just yes. to clarify, so these are haikus that you brought together? Like these aren't, no, these are not haikus. What, what I'm going to share now is free verse. But it's it based on funny something you said? No, this is, this is the kind of theoretical poetry and poetic inquiry that's going on these days. And as I said at the uh, earlier, uh, at the sixth International Poetic Inquiry Conference, 90% of what was going on was this kind of stuff, but um, ours was the only one that was music and poetry, um, in a sense that it was newly composed music for the poetry and meant to bring meaning, enhance the meaning, pardon? To augment the poetry, yes, and, and, and uh, extend the meaning of the poetry. So, uh, enter alpha. Here it is. Returning in March, after seven years of November to January rain, I know only I have forgotten the winters I grew up with. For a few days, I walk in Corner Brook as if I am fighting winter. Head down, going somewhere fast, except I move slowly. Almost pantomime, pushing myself through winter like walking underwater. I must learn to lean with winter, seek its erratic rhythms. Like a dory sliding up and down the smooth sides of a rough sea. I taste winter. Winter savors my body with a lustful lover's appetite. Snow bites, pinches, pokes, stabs, slices like a set of sharp knives in a TV infomercial neatly skinning a tomato. Snow acts with verb exuberance, a veritable thesaurus of action words. Winter reduces the world people stay home for huddle in their cars more, hide in shopping malls more. Deep snow, hard packed snow, plowed snow, powder snow. No hint of spring anywhere, except that spring always comes. Sunglasses essential, blind color, light and shadow, tear the retina. Snow in mountain creases and cracks a monochrome world. Like the alphabet on paper, a text I am learning to read again. Reminded how quickly I grew illiterate, lost my language. What do you think about that? <laughs> is it effective? It makes I sense. It's difficult because I find myself having to listen to two series. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm very involved in the music, obviously. Right. And so you, you want to probably look at the score, and, I, and then when we presented it, I showed the score. Yeah, I find myself analyzing it. Why did you do that then? Right. And then, I, and then I did take it apart and just play the guitar part separately. And then we did it together and so in, in, in trying to for me my explanation of what was going on metaphorically I think it kind of works so this is coming out in this will be a, a chapter uh, with another piece as well in a new book that's being edited uh, for Cambridge University Press by Pamela Bernard I don't know if you know her at Cambridge mm -hmm. but it's uh, International Handbook of Educational Arts Research so um, yeah, you can read what I think. But I, you know, my frustration is, is that every time I do something like this, I don't have someone like you folks in the audience to give me a critique. Yeah. Say, wait a second, Peter, that's baloney. <laughs> or, wow, that's cool. I really like what you did here, right? Or where did you get the ground base? Where did you get the idea for that, right? And how did you keep that going and, and keep all that other stuff going at the same time? I, I'll be honest with you, I, I need the notation to play that again. At the time when I recorded it, it was 
you know, right there under my fingers. Anyway, he's, she, he's asking because there's a sophistication yeah. in the music. Yeah, he's asking you to listen to that, and then yeah. obviously the the words get lost. Whereas if it's song based, if you like, if it, it's a different type of structure, a different type of process. Uh, it's a different. It's, 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 they come. They come together. Okay. Um, 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 uh, uh, Brian, here, let me play something for you. So, oh God, about four or five years ago, I was watching TV and the movie Must Love Dogs. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Came on, okay. And in it, um, uh, Plummer, um, what's his name? Christopher Plummer, the actor, is an older gentleman and he's getting married to a, a very attractive young woman, and he started reading a poem uh, before the toast. And I heard the poem for the first time. I said, oh my God, that's beautiful. So I typed it in, and uh, I immediately went to my laptop, pulled up the poem, started composing, okay? So this song was written, the melody was written within 20 minutes. I wrote a very, sketchy harmonic accompaniment and then the more I listened to the text and and what I wanted to try and say with the words um, well what I did was I wrote a song on brown penny so here it is tell me what you think of this so um, let's see is this take two perhaps I whispered I am too young ah, sorry can't hear it. It's not, it's not doing it justice, actually. Sorry, it's too garbled. You've got it. Yeah, it's coming out of the TV, so it, the speakers aren't working. But I do, I, I do try to write songs as well, yeah. right? And uh, I'm always looking for good poetry from, uh, from a lyrical perspective. And that's also difficult because many poets don't have a, a sense of musicality, <laughs> I find. <laughs> Working with Carl is difficult. Because Carl's a damn good poet, but he doesn't have a sense of rhythm. I had to cue him. So he was being cued, uh, or it wasn't me actually, it was the, the recording engineer who would cue him to come in as I was playing the variations to tell him when to start reading his two line verses. It was that difficult for him, too. Yeah, sorry. Uh, well, there was just a, um, a couple of comments as well. I was appreciating we're coming to the end of our session. Yes. I, I mean, I, I just am for one and sat here thinking about how to translate and apply that across a diverse discipline and perspective. Um, but yeah. but I, I just was thinking that um, I like some of those ideas of techniques of using haiku to help us students and academics and researchers to really think about our reading and reflection through some <coughs> of haiku techniques. Yeah. I think that idea of, of your ideas being uncluttered yet very considered and critical, I think I, think I really Mm -hmm. and, and also that idea of, of that involvement with students in that meaning making process and right. thinking around how as a, as a collective of portraits of through, through some of these techniques of using poetry to capture the essence of people's learning experiences, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. teaching experiences, I, I think it holds a lot of, a lot of benefit. But, but it, I, I think it is this, that we've had an hour to try and think about its application. And I think we have to do a lot more thinking, perhaps, of how we could use this as a research group here in the lab mm -hmm. to capture learning from projects, you know, and how we can offer this, this as, as some other forms of, of data representation. Right. Um, so I, I think maybe there's more conversations we have to have um, that, you, that you've started for us here. Um, Certainly. And just thinking how we would publish some of this, you know, to... Because I often think, you know, the artists would... You know, that their piece of art or, um, you know, that's, that's offered to the world, isn't it? It's here, take it, have it, think of it what you will. And I, I guess in often in our research papers, we try and account for everything. We try and explain everything and, and discuss it and come to our recommendations where some of this, like the, the poem is offered. It's given to, uh, to, to, for your response, like right. a piece of art, like a piece of music. And it, it just shifts an idea of research practice and representation. I think that's really exciting right. for us. So thank you for sowing some ideas with us. And, uh, 
and let's hope to, I'd, I'd like to carry on with it. So people that are interested, please do keep connected with me. I've got some cards, you know where we are here in the lab. But maybe we need a community of people to want to carry on a conversation around what we think this could hold, hold for us as means, as a, as a way of practice, for pedagogy, for research. So I'm offering that. I would like that opportunity. Because it's not, not easy work, this. I think it would, it's uncomfortable. It's exposing. And, and it will take us some practice. But yeah. Thank you. Any just final questions for Peter? Um, I was wondering if you've done this, because obviously the haiku that you've done is essentially about you know, a reflection on your relationship to music and so forth. And I, but I wondered if you actually looked at the music itself and had students or whoever. No, I haven't, and that would be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. and actually you could do it as a dialogue, because obviously you can then take that and then reinterpret it as music. Sure. Uh, oh, yeah. Way, uh, um, Murray Schaefer wrote a haiku suite, yeah. right? So it's very interesting. And so tomorrow we're going to be playing with some of Mary Schaefer's concepts and, and thinking of it in terms of alternative forms of representation and yet, a, yet a, another level. Uh, so one final question. Yeah. Final, honestly. What are yeah. you going to play on the guitar? I was going to play a dad-dad thing. Yeah, because I was coming to England, I, I've been um, playing... Um, uh, I did some arrangements, some fingerstyle arrangements of Beatles tunes. So this one is in Dadgad, and it goes like this. Thanks very much.